Hi, and welcome to Sociology One. We're looking at Chapter Five, looking at the social structure, society, and social interaction. So the social structure and social interaction are fundamental parts of living in a society. So understanding the components of the social structure and social sociological explanations about the rules that guide social interaction can help us understand our behavior and the behavior of others. So the social structure gives us the ability to interpret the social situations we encounter. For example, we expect our families to care for us, our schools to educate us, and our police to protect us. When our circumstances change dramatically, most of us feel an acute sense of anxiety because well, we don't know what to expect and what's going to be expected of us. So this chapter, it may be more manageable to relate to as we all play roles, we all have some degree of status and statuses, so we think so we can think about our own lives when we explore this chapter. So let's get started. Now social structure provides the framework within which we interact with others at a micro level. Now remember macro and micro. Macro is big picture view of the world, so looking at society of all of Ontario or of Canada for example, and micro is looking at the one-to-one -one interactions that we have with one another. So at the micro level, social structure is a stable pattern of social relationships that exist within a particular group or society. This social structure includes social institutions, groups, statuses, roles, and norms. And it provides a map of our encounters, but it may also limit our options by creating boundaries that define which persons are on the inside and which are on the outside. At the macro level of all societies, certain basic activities routinely occur. Social institutions are by are the means by which these basic needs are met. Now the, the functionalist theorists, they emphasize that social institutions exist because they perform the essential tasks, replacing members in a society through having children in a family, teaching new members, that's the formal and informal instruction about norms, producing and distributing and consuming goods and services, preserving order, and providing and maintaining a sense of purpose. Conflict theorists, they also believe that social institutions are, are or originally were organized to meet the basic social needs. However, they argue that social institutions maintain the privileges of the wealthy and powerful while contributing to the powerlessness of others. The term social margin marginality, this is the state of being a part being part sort of inside and part sort of outside. It can result from being, uh, it, can re it can result and to be followed by stigmatization, anything which devalues social identity so that it disqualifies an individual from full um, social acceptance. For example, a convicted criminal wearing a prison uniform is an example of a uh, a person who is being stigmatized. The uniform says that the person has done something wrong and should be, uh, and should not be allowed, sorry, should not be allowed unsupervised outside the prison walls. People who are homeless are marginalized from society as well. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through a series of terms and definitions that help us understand society our role in society or our place in society and how it functions. And we'll start with the definition of status. Status is a socially defined, now again, it's socially defined. That means what is status in North America or in Canada may not be the same around the world. And it's defining the position in a, in a group or a society characterized by certain expectations, rights, and duties. The status of a professional athlete rock musician, a professor, a college student, and homeless person all exist exclusive or separate from a specific individual. That is to say, you're not born with a status. You know, people aren't born necessarily homeless. People may find themselves in their lives as in homelessness, and that's a status that gets applied to them at some specific time and 
to that specific person who occupies those social positions. Some of you are in police foundations or in nursing and the statuses associated with being an officer or a nurse aren't yours. They are social positions that exist whether you graduate and get into those positions or not. So when you do graduate and you hold those positions, they come with statuses that you need to achieve or you need to hold up. And that's what statuses are. So for example, although thousands of new students are going to arrive on college campuses each year to occupy the status of first year student, the status of college student and the expectations attached to that position have remained relatively unchanged over the years. The term status does not refer to high level positions only. And that's what misunderstood about statuses. Sociologists use it to refer to all socially defined positions. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Status set, now they notice the term I've added set, is made up all of, of all the statuses that a person occupies at a given time. Not very rarely do we only occupy one status. A person may be a psychologist, a professor, a wife, a mother, a Roman Catholic, a school volunteer, an Ontario resident, and a French Canadian, each of which has its own status. So that would be what we would call a status set. All the different stati, that's the multiple for statuses, um, that we can be in and live up to uh, are what are our status sets. And everybody's could be marginally to very significantly different. Now, two other terms related to uh, status, and again, these will be applicable to you. Ascribed status, these are the social positions conferred to a person at birth or received involuntary in life. Marie, for example, is a female born to French Canadian parents. She was assigned these statuses at birth. She didn't earn them. So your status of male or female, your status of family, your status of socioeconomic income at birth are all assigned to you at birth. You didn't have to earn them. Now, alternatively, achieve status. Now, this is the social position a person assumes voluntarily as a result of personal choice or merit or direct effort such as your occupation, education, income, are all thought to be gained as a result of personal ability and successful competition. Most occupational positions in modern society are achieved statuses. Ascribed statuses have a significant influence on the achieved statuses that you occupy. So the ascribed status of gender could affect your earning income in the future, ethnicity, Gender, age can affect a person's opportunity to acquire certain achieved statuses. So, ascribed to what you're born with, achieved is what you can earn, and certainly your achieved status can be affected by your ascribed status. Now, I've touched on a number of them, but there's another collection here, another word that we could use along with status, and it's called your master status. Now, master status is a term used to describe the most important status a person occupies. It dominates the individual's other statuses, and it's, um, it's the overriding ingredient that determines a person's general societal position. You know, in, in my life, there was a point in my life where my master status was father. Now, I did other things, but I held master status as father as very important. Certainly, as my daughter got older and my role as father altered and, and changed and the importance of you know occupation became something I was striving for new and, and different things that became a part of my master status and you can oftentimes determine master status by if someone asks you who are you and what do you do and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is I'm a professor then that might be your master status being poor or being rich is the master status that influences many other areas of life, including health, education, and opportunities. Historically, the most common master status for women have been related to, related to the positions of, in the family, such as daughter, wife, and mother. For men, occupation has usually been the most important status, although occupation is increasingly a master status for women as well. 
master statuses confer high and low levels of personal worth and dignity on people. Now, uh, these are not characteristics that we inherently possess. They are derived from the statuses we occupy. So, as you might imagine, status symbols are the material signs that inform others of a, of a person's specific status. In North America society, people who have made it frequently want symbols to inform others of their accomplishments. So if I've made it by making money, I might buy cars, houses, properties, clothing, jewelry, things that are status symbols to let everybody around me know, look how successful I am. So, as I mentioned, uh, for example, just as wearing a wedding ring proclaims that a person is married, owning a Rolls Royce announces that someone has made it. Status symbols for those with homes and the homeless may have different meanings. Among the affluent person, a full shopping cart in the grocery store and bags of merchandise from expensive department stores indicate a lofty financial uh, position. By contrast, among the homeless, bulging shopping bags and overloaded grocery carts suggest a completely different status. The next section we're going to enter into when we look at some of these terms in regards to the organization of society, we're going to touch on roles. And there's a series of them. You'll find them in your textbook, so you can feel free to refer back. A role is a set of behavioral expectations associated with a given status. We occupy a status, we play a role. So if I play the role, if I have the status, if you will, of police officer or nurse, then my role of nurse or police officer is what I do to meet that status that we occupy. Role expectation, this is a, this is, you know, a group or society's definition of the way a specific role ought to be played. Now this is this, this socially constructed, so you know how we in this in our culture view police or nurses and the roles that they play is defined by our society. How they play out in other societies might be different in regards to the police officer's integrity to the law might vary from culture to culture or what role is it that nurses do? Are they um, supporting and helpful with doctors or are they the primary caregivers for many people that they will run up against. Role performance is how the person actually plays the role. So I understand the status of police or nursing and I know that there's a role and there's a job description if you will that tells me how to do that. My role performance is how I actually play that role. Now I might not do everything that fits within the role and therefore not meet the, the status of that role and I might be asked to explain myself by my um, uh, employer. However, I might exceed those things as well. Role performance does not always match role expectations. Some, status, some statuses have role expectations that are highly specific such as that of a surgeon or a university professor. Other statuses, such as a friend or significant other, have less structured expectations. Role expectations tied to the status of student are more specific than those being tied to as a friend. As a student, you have specific expectations that you need to do. You need to do your work. You need to make sure you attend class. You need to read the material. You need to do tests, hand in assignments, and achieve certain grades in order to graduate. Role expectations are typically based on a range of acceptable behavior rather than on a strictly defined um, standards. Another term, role ambiguity. This is when the expectations associated with a specific role aren't very clear. Or role conflict. This occurs when an incomplete role demands or incom incompatible. Sorry, I'm going to say that over again. Role conflict occurs when incompatible role demands are placed on a person by two or more statuses held at the same time. So if you're, and you'll find that role conflict enters into a lot of uh, people's lives when they have young families and both parents have jobs. You have all this responsibility for job, for parenting, and sometimes it just becomes difficult to do both things. Role strain is when incompatible demands are placed on a single status that a person occupies and it just, as the term suggests, it creates a great deal of strain. Rule exit 
Well, this occurs when people disengage from social roles that have been central to their self-identities. You see, like common, a common role exit is retirement. You know, you leave that status and the roles that you've had that have been central to your identity. And in the past, that was really difficult for men who were, you know, in the 60s and the 50s, they were the breadwinners and then they exited and retired. They had lost their purpose, if you will. Now there's four stages of role exit. There's the certain, there's doubt, there's the search for alternatives, there's a turning point, and then there's the creation of the new identity. And as we age, that's very much a part. There's doubt about whether we can, there's a search about, that is retire, a search about well, what are my alternatives and how can I do this? There's a turning point and a sort of an aha, I can do this or I can't. And then there's the creation of that new identity of myself as a retired person or whatever my alternatives really spelled out for me. Now, all of what we've done is really looked at the nuances, the sort of minutia of little points that sort of help us understand the social environment. Now, we can also look at the social groups and social groups consist of two or more people who interact frequently and share common identity and a feeling of interdependence. Now, interdependence is not independent, doing it by yourself, or dependent, doing it with somebody else because you need them. Interdependent just means that sharing of back and forth. Now, groups, um, groups are, other, uh, are another important component to social structures. Now, groups we're going to find out are variable, and I'll walk, I'll walk you through that. Um, Throughout our lives, most of us participate in groups from our family, childhood friends, to our community, um, our community, our university classes, our college classes, to our work and community organizations, and even to society. So we're gonna look at the broad brush strokes of two types of groups. There's primary group. This is a small, less specialized group in which members engage in face-to-face emotion-based interactions over a long period of time. Now there's probably a lot, of fa- you know, a lot of people who might say, well, that's my family. And that's an example, and we'll get into more. The secondary group, this is larger, more specialized group in which members are engaged in more impersonal, goal-oriented relationships for a limited period of time. This might look like your job, your workplace. So typically, Primary groups include your family, close friends, school or work-related peer group, schools, churches, and corporations are examples of secondary groups. Social solidarity or social cohesion relates to a group's ability to maintain itself in the face of obstacles. Social solidarity exists when social bonds, attractions, or other forces hold members of a group into uh, in interaction over a period of time. Relatedly, the social network, and you've probably heard this term before, or at least you will be familiar with it when you hear the definition, it's a series of social relationships that link an individual to others. If you run into a problem, you will reach out to your social network, people that you rely on for help or people who you trust. This is all a part of your social network. Okay. We're moving along pretty rapidly. I'm trying to keep the video within 30 minutes. So let's keep going. Formal organizations. A highly structured group formed for the purpose of completing certain tasks or achieving specific goals. Now many of us spend most of our time in formal organizations such as colleges and universities, corporations, or in the government, um, in government roles. Formal organizations are an important component for social structure in all industrial societies. We expect such organizations to educate us, solve our social problems such as crime or homelessness, and provide work opportunities. Now I've mentioned already, and we're going to review this kind of on the quick, social institutions. Now this is a set of organized beliefs and rules that establish how a society will attempt to meet the basic social needs of that society. The social institutions are the means by which these basic needs are met. At the macro level of all societies, certain basic activities routinely occur. Children are born, they're socialized, 
goods and services are produced and distributed, order is preserved, and a sense of purpose is maintained. Now in the past, these needs have centered around five basic social institutions. The family, religion, education, the economy, and the government or politics. Now today, mass media, sports, science and medicine, the military, are also considered social institutions. Now some of you may be wondering, and good for you if you are, if you are wondering, aren't social institutions just another group? Well, a group is composed of specific, identifiable people, whereas institutions is a standardized way of doing something. Now, the, there are people who are in those institutions, but those institutions aren't dependent on any one individual. You know, in politics, we have elections, and one's coming up. Don't oh, forget to vote. One's coming up, and so that sort of is a way of changing the people, but the institution of economy and politics remains, you know, remains there. Families have different people with different forms of family, but we still have an institution of family. But good for you for asking the question or thinking in those terms. Uh, when we talk about one's family, uh, we're referring to a specific family, that's the group. When we refer to family as a social institution, we're talking about the ideologies and standardized patterns of behavior that organize the family. So that, so for example, the family as a social institution contains certain statuses organized into well-defined relationships such as husband, wife, parent, child, brother, sister, and so forth. Specific families do not always conform to these ide ideologies or patterns. I mean, if you are a single parent, uh, you have different uh, well-defined relationships and they won't involve a husband. It might involve your, your uh, ex-partner as a co-parent in some capacity, and that's different than living together as parents. So let's consider the two, two primary sort of theories that look at this. We're going to start with functionalist theory. The social institutions exist because they perform essential tasks. So the, for the functionalists, remember, they are looking at there's a slow shift and changes over time, but societies are essentially stable, and it's the norms and values that are the glue that keeps the society together and keeps it um, uh, stable. So some of the functions that need to occur by these institutions is one, and this is predominantly the family, of course, is replacing its members. Families have children, and the more children we have, the more we replace those that pass away or move away. Societies and groups must have socially approved ways of replacing members who move away or die. And that's the family. That's a social institution. Secondly, the institutions are involved with uh, teaching new members. People who are born into a society or move into it must learn the group's values and customs. So that's family, that's education, to some degree, and maybe to some people's perspective, a greater degree, that's including media. So when you are raising your own child, you're raising them and teaching them the norms and the values that you hold as a parent, your family hold as a historic line of family, and your society hold. Now, if you're a new member from another country coming into, say, in this case, Canada, how you get taught about what it is to fit within this society and our society's values and groups, well, that can come from some of the same places. Three, producing and distributing and consuming goods and services. All societies must provide and distribute goods and services for their members, and this is essentially having an economy, a means by which to pay people and give money in order for them to pay for the goods and services that they need, they need and want. Four, preserving order. Every group or society must preserve order within its boundaries and protect itself from attack from outsiders. And this would involve, you know, in terms of Canada, this would involve government, um, the, the military, um, other sort of related institutions that are sub sub institutions that would help do this sort of guarding if you will and then five providing and maintaining a sense of purpose 
To motivate people to cooperate with one another, a sense of purpose is needed. Now this can come from cultural institutions like sports, it could come from uh, religion, it can come from media, but we gain, our me we gain our sense of purpose about what does our culture value. Now if we look at it from conflict theory, they argue that many social institutions do not work for the common good of everybody in society. So, for example, the government maintains the privilege of the wealthy and the powerful while contributing to the powerlessness of others. Conflict theory, uh, theorists agree with functionalists that social institutions are originally organized to meet the basic social need. However, they do not agree that social institutions work for the common good of everyone in society. Some families abuse children, statuses... Uh, state, sorry, some families that abuse children, so it's not equal, uh, states um, tend to support the wealthy but not the marginalized. Religion often controls people rather than giving them the meaning and freedom. It really sort of depends on the different religions, but we have so many different religions, and that's part of what for the conflicts is a bit of an issue is what religions are being positively supporting people to have control of their lives and give them meaning and freedoms. Alrighty, that's a lot of content. You'll find that all in your textbook. Please take the time to review it. And um, we'll do part two in week eight. Alright everybody, good luck and keep up the good work and enjoy your break. Work hard. Bye now.